Part One, Chapter Nine of A Raw Youth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by L. T. A Raw Youth by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. Part One, Chapter Nine. One. I hurried home and, marvelous to relate. I was very well satisfied with myself. That's not the way one talks to women, of course, and to such women, too. It would be truer to say such a woman, for I was not considering Tatyana Pavlovna. Perhaps it's out of the question to say to a woman of that class that one spits on her intrigues, but I had said that, and it was just that that I was pleased with. Apart from anything else, I was convinced that by taking this tone I had effaced all that was ridiculous in my position but I had not time to think much about that. My mind was full of craft. Not that the thought of him distressed me very greatly, but yet I was shaken to my inmost depths, and so much so that the ordinary human feeling of pleasure at another man's misfortune, at his breaking his leg or covering himself with disgrace, at his losing someone dear to him, and so on, even this ordinary feeling of mean satisfaction was completely eclipsed by another absolutely single-hearted feeling. A feeling of sorrow, of compassion for craft, at least I don't know whether it was compassion, but it was a strong and warm-hearted feeling. And I was glad of this, too. It's marvelous how many irrelevant ideas can flash through the mind at the very time when one is shattered by some tremendous piece of news, which one would have thought must overpower all other feelings and banish all extraneous thoughts, especially petty ones. Yet petty ones, on the contrary, obtrude themselves. I remember, too, that I was gradually overcome by a quite perceptible nervous shudder, which lasted several minutes, in fact all the time I was home and talking to Versilov. This interview followed under strange and exceptional circumstances. I had mentioned already that we lived in a separate lodge in the courtyard. This lodging was marked number 13. Before I had entered the gate I heard a woman's voice asking loudly with impatience and irritation, Where is number 13? The question was asked by a lady who was standing close to the gate and had opened the door of the little shop but apparently she got no answer there, or was even repulsed, for she came down the steps resentful and angry. "'But where is the porter?' she cried, stamping her foot. I had already recognized the voice. "'I'm going to number thirteen, I said, approaching her. "'Whom do you want?' "'I have been looking for the porter for the last hour. I keep asking everyone. I have been up all the staircases. "'It's in the yard. Don't you recognize me?' But by now she had recognized me. You want Versilov. You want to see him about something, and so do I, I went on. I have come to take leave of him forever. Come along. You are his son? That means nothing. Granted, though, that I am his son, yet my name's Dolgoruki. I am illegitimate. This gentleman has an endless supply of illegitimate children. When conscience and honor require it, a son will leave his father's house. That's in the Bible. He has come into a fortune, too and I don't wish to share it, and I go to live by the work of my hands. A noble-hearted man will sacrifice life itself if need be. Kraft has shot himself. Kraft, for the sake of an idea, imagine, a young man, yet he overcame hope. This way, this way. We live in a lodge apart, but that's in the Bible. Children leave their parents and make homes for themselves. If the idea draws one on, if there is an idea... The idea is what matters. The idea is everything. I babbled on like this while we were making our way to the lodge. The reader will no doubt observe that I don't spare myself much, though I give myself a good character on occasion. I want to train myself to tell the truth. Versilov was at home. I went in without taking off my overcoat. She did the same. Her clothes were dreadfully thin. Over a wretched gown of some dark color was hung a rag that did duty for a cloak or mantle. On her head she wore an old and frayed sailor hat, which was very unbecoming. When we went into the room my mother was sitting at her usual place at work, and my sister came out of her room to see who it was and was standing in the doorway. Versilov, as usual, was doing nothing, and he got up to meet us. He looked at me intently with a stern and inquiring gaze. "'It's nothing to do with me,' I hastened to explain, and I stood on one side. "'I only met this person at the gate.' She was trying to find you, and no one could direct her. I have come about my own business, which I shall be delighted to explain afterwards. 
Ursulov nevertheless still scrutinized me curiously. Excuse me, the girl began impatiently. Ursulov turned towards her. I have been wondering a long while what induced you to leave money for me yesterday. I, in short, here's your money. She almost shrieked as she had before and flung a bundle of notes on the table. I've had to hunt for you through the address bureau or I should have brought it before. Listen, you, she suddenly addressed my mother, who had turned quite pale. I don't want to insult you. You look honest, and perhaps this is actually your daughter. I don't know whether you are his wife, but let me tell you that this gentleman gets hold of the advertisements on which teachers and governesses have spent their last farthing, and visits these luckless wretches with dishonorable motives, trying to lure them to ruin by money. I don't understand how I could have taken his money yesterday. He looked so honest. Get away! Don't say a word! You are a villain, sir. Even if you had honorable intentions, I don't want your charity. Not a word, not a word. Oh, how glad I am that I have unmasked you now before your women. Curse you! She ran to the door, but turned for one instant in the doorway to shout, You've come into a fortune, I'm told. With that, she vanished like a shadow. I repeat again, it was frenzy. Versilov was greatly astonished. He stood as though pondering and reflecting on something. At last he turned suddenly to me. You don't know her at all? I happened to see her this morning when she was raging in the passage at Vassin's. She was screaming and cursing you, but I did not speak to her, and I know nothing about it. And just now I met her at the gate. No doubt she is that teacher you spoke of yesterday, who also gives lessons in arithmetic. Yes, she is. For once in my life I did a good deed, and... But what's the matter with you? Here is this letter, I answered. I don't think explanation necessary. It comes from Kraft and he got it from Andronikov. You will understand what's in it. I will add that no one but me in the whole world knows about that letter, for Kraft, who gave me that letter yesterday just as I was leaving him, has shot himself. While I was speaking with breathless haste, he took the letter, and holding it lightly poised in his left hand, watched me attentively. When I told him of Kraft's suicide, I looked at him with particular attention to see the effect. And what did I see? The news did not make the slightest impression on him. If he had even raised an eyebrow. On the contrary, seeing that I had paused, he drew out his eyeglasses, which he always had about him hanging on a black ribbon, carried the letter to the candle, and glancing at the signature, began carefully examining it. I can't express how mortified I was at this supercilious callousness. He must have known Kraft very well. It was, in any case, such an extraordinary piece of news. Besides, I naturally desired it to produce an effect. Knowing that the letter was long, I turned after waiting and went out. My trunk had been packed long ago. I had only to stuff a few things into my bag. I thought of my mother and that I had not gone up to speak to her. Ten minutes later, when I had finished my preparations and was meaning to go for a cab, my sister walked into the attic. Here are your sixty rubles. Mother sends it and begs you again to forgive her for having mentioned it to Andrei Petrovich. And here's twenty rubles besides. You gave her fifty yesterday for your board. Mother says she can't take more than thirty from you because you haven't cost fifty, and she sends you twenty rubles back. Well, thanks, if she's telling the truth. Goodbye, sister. I'm going. Where are you going now? For the time being, to a hotel. To escape spending the night in this house. Tell mother that I love her. She knows that. She knows that you love Andrei Petrovich, too. I wonder you are not ashamed of having brought that wretched girl here. I swear I did not. I met her at the gate. No, it was your doing. I assure you. Think a little. Ask yourself, and you will see that you were the cause. I was only very pleased that Versilov should be put to shame. Imagine he had a baby by Lydia Amakov. But what am I telling you? He? A baby? But it is not his child. From whom have you heard such a falsehood? Why, you can know nothing about it. Me know nothing about it? But I used to nurse the baby in Luga. Listen, brother, I've seen for a long time past that you know nothing about anything, and meanwhile you wound Andrei Petrovich, and mother too. If he is right, then I shall be to blame. That's all, and I love you no less for it. What makes you flush like that, sister? And more still now, well, never mind anyhow. 
I shall challenge that little prince for the slap he gave Versilov at Ems. If Versilov was in the right as regards Mile Amakov, so much the better. Brother, what are you thinking of? Luckily, the lawsuit's over now. Well, now she has turned white. But the prince won't fight you, said Liza, looking at me with a wan smile in spite of her alarm. Then I will put him to shame in public. What's the matter with you, Liza? She had turned so pale that she could not stand and sank onto my sofa. Liza! My mother's voice called from below. She recovered herself and stood up. She smiled at me affectionately. Brother, drop this foolishness or put it off for a time till you know about ever so many things. It's awful how little you understand. I shall remember, Liza, that you turned pale when you heard I was going to fight a duel. Yes, yes, remember that too, she said, smiling once more at parting, and she went downstairs. I called a cab, and with the help of the man I hauled my things out of the lodge. No one in the house stopped me or opposed my going. I did not go in to say goodbye to my mother as I did not want to meet Versilov again. When I was sitting in the cab a thought flashed upon me. To Fontanka by Semyonovsky Bridge, I told the man, and went back to Vassin's. 2. It suddenly struck me that Vassin would know already about craft, and perhaps know a hundred times more than I did, and so it proved to be. Vassin immediately informed me of all the facts with great precision but with no great warmth. I concluded that he was very tired, and so indeed he was. He had been at Kraft's himself in the morning. Kraft had shot himself with a revolver, that same revolver, after dark, as was shown by his diary. The last entry in the diary was made just before the fatal shot, and in it he mentioned that he was writing almost in the dark and hardly able to distinguish the letters, that he did not want to light a candle for fear that it should set fire to something when he was dead. And I don't want to light it, and then, before shooting, put it out like my life, he added strangely, almost the last words. This diary he had begun three days before his death, immediately on his return to Petersburg, before his visit to Durgachev's. After I had gone away, he had written something in it every quarter of an hour. The last three or four entries were made at intervals of fifteen minutes. I expressed aloud my surprise that though Vassin had had this diary so long in his hands, it had been given to him to read. He had not made a copy of it, especially as it was not more than a sheet or so and all the entries were short. You might at least have copied the last page, Vassin observed with a smile that he remembered it as it was. Moreover, that the entries were quite disconnected about anything that came into his mind. I was about to protest that this was just what was precious in this case, but without going into that I began instead to insist on his recalling some of it, and he did recall a few sentences, for instance, an hour before he shot himself, that he was chilly, that he thought of drinking a glass of wine to warm himself, but he had been deterred by the idea that it might cause an increase in the flow of blood. It was almost all that sort of thing, Vassin remarked in conclusion. "'And you call that nonsense?' I cried. "'And when did I call it nonsense? "'I simply did not copy it. "'But though it's not nonsense, "'the diary certainly is somewhat ordinary, "'or rather natural. "'That is, it's just what it's bound to be "'in such circumstances. "'But the last thoughts! "'The last thoughts! "'The last thoughts sometimes are extremely insignificant. "'One such suicide complained, in fact, "'in a similar diary,' that not one lofty idea visited him at that important hour, nothing but futile and petty thoughts. And that he was chilly, was that too a futile thought? Do you mean his being chilly or the thought about the blood? Besides, it's a well-known fact that very many people who are capable of contemplating their approaching death, whether it's by their own hand or not, frequently show a tendency to worry themselves about leaving their body in a presentable condition. It was from that point of view that Kraft was anxious about the blood. I don't know whether that is a well-known fact, or whether that is so, I muttered, but I am surprised that you consider all that natural. And yet it's not long since Kraft was speaking, feeling, sitting among us. Surely you must feel sorry for him. Oh, of course I'm sorry, and that's quite a different thing. But in any case, Kraft himself conceived of his death as a logical deduction. It turns out that all that was said about him yesterday at Durgachev's was true, he left behind him a manuscript book full of abstruse theories, proving by phrenology, by craniology, and even by mathematics that the Russians are a second-rate race, and that therefore, since he was a Russian, life was not worth living for him. 
What is more striking about it, if you like, is that it shows one can make any logical deduction one pleases. But to shoot oneself in consequence of a deduction does not always follow. At least one must do credit to his strength of will. Possibly not that only, Basson observed evasively. It was clear that he assumed stupidity or weakness of intellect. All this irritated me. You talked of feeling yourself yesterday, Vasson. I don't gainsay it now, but what has happened betrays something in him so crudely mistaken that, if one looks at it critically, it checks one's compassion in spite of oneself. Do you know that I guessed yesterday from your eyes that you would disapprove of Kraft, and I resolved not to ask your opinion, that I might not hear evil of him, but you have given it of yourself, and I am forced to agree with you in spite of myself, and yet I am annoyed with you. I am sorry for Kraft. Do you know we are going rather far? Yes, yes, I interrupted. But it's a comfort anyhow that in such cases those who are left alive, the critics of the dead, can save themselves. Though a man has shot himself who was worthy of all compassion and indulgence, we are left at any rate, and so there's no great need to grieve. Yes, of course, from that point of view. Oh, but I believe you're joking, and very cleverly. I always drink tea at this time, and I'm just going to ask for it. You will join me, perhaps? And he went out, with a glance at my trunk and bag. I had wanted to say something rather spiteful, to retaliate for his judgment of craft, and I had succeeded in saying it, but it was curious that he had taken my consoling reflection that such as we are left as meant seriously. But be that as it may, he was, anyway, more right than I was in everything, even in his feelings. I recognized this without the slightest dissatisfaction, but I felt distinctly that I did not like him. When they had brought in the tea, I announced that I was going to ask for his hospitality for one night only, and if this were impossible, I had hoped he would say so, and I would go to a hotel. Then I briefly explained my reasons, simply and frankly stating that I had finally quarreled with Versilov, without, however, going into details. Vassin listened attentively, but without the slightest excitement. As a rule, he only spoke in reply to questions, though he always answered with ready courtesy and sufficient detail. I said nothing at all about the letter concerning which I had come to ask his advice in the morning and I explained that I had looked in then simply to call on him. Having given Versilov my word that no one else should know of the letter, I considered I had no right to speak of it to anyone. I felt it for some reason peculiarly repugnant to speak of certain things to Vassin, of some things and not of others. I succeeded, for instance, in interesting him in my description of the scenes that had taken place that morning in the passage, in the next room, and finally at Versilov's. He listened with extreme attention, especially to what I told him of Stabelkov. When I told him how Stabelkov asked about Durgachev, he made me repeat the question again, and seemed to ponder gravely over it, though he did not laugh in the end. It suddenly occurred to me at that moment that nothing could ever have disconcerted Vesin. I remember, however, that this idea presented itself at first in a form most complimentary to him. In fact, I could not gather much from what Mr. Stabelkov said, I added finally. He talks in a sort of muddle and there is something, as it were, feather-headed about him. Vassin at once assumed a serious air. He certainly has no gift for language, but he sometimes manages to make very acute observations at first sight, and in fact he belongs to the class of businessmen, men of practical affairs, rather than of theoretical ideas. One must judge them from that point of view. It was exactly what I had imagined him saying that morning. He made an awful row next door, though, and goodness knows how it might have ended— of the inmates of the next room, Vassin told me that they had been living there about three weeks and had come from somewhere in the provinces, that their room was very small, and that to all appearance they were very poor, that they stayed in and seemed to be expecting something. He did not know the young woman had advertised for lessons, but he had heard that Versilov had been to see them. It had happened in his absence, but the landlady had told him of it. The two ladies had held themselves aloof from everyone, even from the landlady. During the last few days he had indeed become aware that something was wrong with them, but there had been no other scenes like the one that morning. I recall all that was said about the people next door because of what followed. All this time there was a dead silence in the room. Vassin listened with marked interest when I told him that Stabelkov had said he must talk to the landlady about our neighbors, and that he had twice repeated, "'Ah, you will see, you will see.' "'And you will see,' added Vassin, "'that that notion of his stands for something.' He has an extraordinarily keen eye for such things. Why, do you think the landlady ought to be advised to turn them out? 
No, I did not mean that they should be turned out, simply that there might be a scandal. But all such cases end one way or another. Let's drop the subject. As for Versilov's visit next door, he absolutely refused to give any opinion. Anything is possible. A man feels that he has money in his pocket, but he may very likely have given the money from charity. That would perhaps be in accordance with his traditions and his inclinations. I told him that Stabelkov had chattered that morning about a baby. Stabelkov is absolutely mistaken about that, Vassin brought out with peculiar emphasis and gravity. I remembered this particularly. Stabelkov sometimes puts too much faith in his practical common sense, and so is in too great a hurry to draw conclusions to fit in with his logic, which is often very penetrating, and all the while the actual fact may be far more fantastic and surprising when one considers the character of the persons concerned in it. So it has been in this case. Having a partial knowledge of the affair, he concluded the child belonged to Versilov, and yet the child is not Versilov's. I pressed him, and to my great amazement learned from him that the infant in question was the child of Prince Sergei Sokolsky. Lydia Amakov, either owing to her illness or to some fantastic streak in her character, used at times to behave like a lunatic. She had been fascinated by the prince before she met Versilov, and he had not scrupled to accept her love, to use Vassin's expression. The liaison had lasted but for a moment, they had quarreled, as we know already, and Lydia had dismissed the prince, at which the latter seems to have been relieved. She was a very strange girl, added Vassin. It is quite possible that she was not always in her right mind. But when he went away to Paris, Prince Sokolsky had no idea of the condition of which he left his victim. He did not know until the end, until his return. Versilov, who had become a friend of the young ladies, offered her his hand, in view of her situation, of which it appears her parents had no suspicion up to the end. The lovesick damsel was overjoyed and saw in Versilov's offer something more than self-sacrifice, though that too she appreciated. Of course, though, he knew how to carry it through, Versilov added. The baby, a girl, was born a month or six weeks before the proper time. It was placed out somewhere in Germany, but afterwards taken back by Versilov and is now somewhere in Russia, perhaps in Petersburg. And the phosphorus matches? I know nothing about that. Vassin said in conclusion. Lydia Amakov died a fortnight after her confinement. What had happened, I don't know. Prince Sokolsky, who had only just returned from Paris, learned there was a child, and seems not to have believed at first that it was his child. The whole affair has, in fact, been kept secret by all parties up till now. But what a wretch this prince must be, I cried indignantly. What a way to treat an invalid girl. She was not so much of an invalid then. Besides, she sent him away herself. It is true, perhaps, that he was in too great a hurry to take advantage of his dismissal. You justify a villain like that? No, only I don't call him a villain. There is a great deal in it besides simply villainy. In fact, it's quite an ordinary thing. Tell me, Vassin, did you know him intimately? I should particularly value your opinion, owing to a circumstance that touches me very nearly. But to this, Vassin replied with excessive reserve. He knew the prince, but he was, with obvious intention, reticent in regard to the circumstances under which he had made his acquaintance. He added further that one had to make allowances for Prince Sokolsky's character. He is impressionable and full of honorable impulses, but has neither good sense nor strength of will enough to control his desires. He is not a well-educated man. Many ideas and situations are beyond his power to deal with, and yet he rushes upon them. He will, for example, persist in declaring, I am a prince and descended from Rurik, but there is no reason why I shouldn't be a shoemaker if I have to earn my living. I am not fit for any other calling. Above the shop there shall be Prince So-and-so, bootmaker. It would really be a credit. He would say that and act upon it, too. That's what matters, added Vassin. And yet it's not the result of strong conviction, but only the most shallow impressionability. Afterwards, repentance invariably follows and then he is always ready to push to an opposite extreme. His whole life has passed like that. Many people come to grief in that way nowadays, Vassin ended, just because they are born in this age. I could not help pondering on his words. Is it true that he was turned out of his regiment? I asked. I don't know whether he was turned out, but he certainly did leave the regiment through some unpleasant scandal. I suppose you know that he spent two or three months last autumn at Luga. I, I know that you were staying at Luga at that time. 
Yes, I was there too for a time. Prince Sokolsky knew Lizaveta Makarovna too. Oh, I didn't know. I must confess I've had so little talk with my sister, but surely he was not received in my mother's house, I cried. Oh, no, he was only slightly acquainted with them through other friends. Ah, to be sure, but what did my sister tell me about that child? Was the baby at Luga? For a while. And where is it now? No doubt in Petersburg. I never will believe, I cried in great emotion, that my mother took any part whatever in this scandal with this Lydia. Apart from these intrigues, of which I can't undertake to give the details, there was nothing particularly reprehensible in Versilov's part of the affair, observed Vassin with a condescending smile. I fancy he began to feel it difficult to talk to me, but he tried not to betray it. I will never, never believe, I cried again, that a woman could give up her husband to another woman. That I won't believe. I swear my mother had no hand in it. It seems, though, that she did not oppose it. In her place, from pride, I should not have opposed it. For my part, I absolutely refuse to judge in such a manner, was Vassin's final comment. Perhaps for all his intelligence, Vassin really knew nothing about women, so that a whole cycle of ideas and phenomena remained unknown to him. I sank into silence. Vassin had a temporary berth in some company's office, and I knew that he used to bring work home with him. When I pressed him, he admitted that he had work to do now, accounts to make up, and I begged him warmly not to stand on ceremony with me. I believed this pleased him, but before bringing out his papers, he made up a bed for me on the sofa. At first he offered me his bed, but when I refused it, I think that too gratified him. He got pillows and a quilt from the landlady. Vassin was extremely polite and amiable, but it made me feel uncomfortable seeing him take so much trouble on my account. I had liked it better when, three weeks before, I had spent a night at Effin's. I remember how he had concocted a bed for me, also on a sofa, and without the knowledge of his aunt, who would, he thought, for some reason have been vexed if she had known he had a schoolfellow staying the night with him. We laughed a great deal. A shirt did duty for a sheet and an overcoat for a pillow. I remember how Efim, when he had completed the work, patted the sofa tenderly and said to me, Vous dormirez comme un petit rouille and his foolish mirth and the French phrase, as incongruous in his mouth as a saddle on a cow, made me enjoy sleeping at that jocose youth's. As for Vassin, I felt greatly relieved when he sat down to work with his back to me. I stretched myself on the sofa, and looking at his back, pondered deeply on many things. 3. And indeed I had plenty to think about. Everything seemed split up and in confusion in my soul but certain sensations stood out very definitely, though from their very abundance I was not dominated by any one of them. They all came, as it were, in disconnected flashes, one after another, and I had no inclination, I remember, to dwell on any one of the impressions or to establish any sequence among them. Even the idea of craft had imperceptibly passed into the background. What troubled me most of all was my own position, that here I had broken off and that my trunk was with me, and I was not at home and was beginning everything new. It was as though all my previous intentions and preparations had been in play, and only now, and above all, so suddenly, everything was beginning in reality. This idea gave me courage and cheered me up, in spite of the confusion within me over many things. But, but I had other sensations. One of them was trying to dominate the others and to take possession of my soul, and, strange to say, this sensation, too, gave me courage and seemed to hold out prospects of something very gay. Yet this feeling had begun with fear. I had been afraid for a long time, from the very hour that in my heat I had unawares said too much to Madame Amakov about the document. Yes, I said too much, I thought, and maybe they will guess something. It's a pity. No doubt they will give me no peace if they begin to suspect, but let them. Very likely they won't find me. I'll hide. And what if they really do run after me? And then I began recalling minutely in every point and with growing satisfaction how I had stood up before Katerina Nikolaevna and how her insolent but extremely astonished eyes had gazed at me obstinately. Going away, I had left her in the same amazement. I remembered, her eyes are not quite black, though. It's only her eyelashes that are so black, and that's what makes her eyes look so dark. And suddenly, I remembered, I felt horribly disgusted at the recollection, 
and sick and angry both at them and at myself. I reproached myself and tried to think of something else. Why did I not feel the slightest indignation with Versilov for the incident with the girl in the next room? It suddenly occurred to me to wonder. For my part, I was firmly convinced that he had had amorous designs and had come to amuse himself, but I was not particularly indignant at this. It seemed to me, indeed, that one could not have conceived of his behaving differently, and although I really was glad he had been put to shame, yet I did not blame him. It was not that which seemed important to me. What was important was the exasperation with which he had looked at me when I came in with the girl, the way he had looked at me as he had never done before. At last he has looked at me seriously, I thought, with a flutter at my heart. Ah, if I had not loved him I should not have been so overjoyed at his hatred. At last I began to doze and fell asleep. I can just remember being aware of Vassin's finishing his work, tidying away his things, looking carefully towards my sofa, undressing and putting out the light. It was one o'clock at night. 4. Almost exactly two hours later I woke up with a start, and, jumping as though I were frantic, sat on my sofa. From the next room there arose fearful lamentations, screams, and sounds of weeping. Our door was wide open, and people were shouting and running to and fro in the lighted passage. I was on the point of calling to Vassin, but I realized that he was no longer in his bed. I did not know where to find the matches. I fumbled for my clothes and began hurriedly dressing in the dark. Evidently the landlady and perhaps the lodgers had run into the next room. Only one voice was wailing, however, that of the older woman. The youthful voice I had heard the day before and so well remembered was quite silent. I remember that this was the first thought that came into my mind. Before I had finished dressing, Vassin came in hurriedly. He laid his hand on the matches instantly and lighted up the room. He was in his dressing gown and slippers, and he immediately proceeded to dress. "'What's happened?' I cried. "'A most unpleasant and bothersome business,' he answered almost angrily. "'That young girl you were telling me about has hanged herself in the next room.' I could not help crying out. I cannot describe the pang at my heart. We ran out into the passage. I must own I did not dare go into the room, and only saw the unhappy girl afterwards, when she had been taken down, and even then, indeed, at some distance and covered with a sheet, beyond which the two narrow soles of her shoes stood out. So I did not, for some reason, look into her face. The mother was in a fearful condition. Our landlady was with her, not, however, greatly alarmed. All the lodgers in the flat had gathered round. There were only three of them, an elderly naval man, always very peevish and exacting, though on this occasion he was quite quiet, and an elderly couple, respectable people of the small functionary class who came from the province of Tver. I won't attempt to describe the rest of that night, the general commotion and afterwards the visit of the police. Literally till daylight I kept shuddering and felt it my duty to sit up, though I did absolutely nothing, and indeed everyone had an extraordinarily cheery air, as though they had been particularly cheered by something. Vassin went off somewhere. The landlady turned out to be rather a decent woman, much better than I had imagined her. I persuaded her, and I put it down to my credit, that the mother must not be left alone with the daughter's corpse, and that she must, at least until tomorrow, take her into her room. The landlady at once agreed, and though the mother struggled and shed tears, refusing to leave her daughter, she did at last move into the landlady's room, and the latter immediately ordered the samovar to be brought. After that, the lodgers went back to their rooms and shut the doors, but nothing would have induced me to go to bed, and I remained a long time with the landlady, who was positively relieved at the presence of a third person, and especially one who was able to give some information bearing on the case. The samovar was most welcome, and in fact the samovar is the most essential thing in Russia, especially at times of particularly awful, sudden, and eccentric catastrophes and misfortunes. Even the mother was induced to drink two cups, though, of course, only with much urging and almost compulsion. And yet I can honestly say that I have never seen a bitterer and more genuine sorrow than that poor mother's. After the first paroxysms of sobbing and hysterics, she was actually eager to talk, and I listened greedily to her story. There are unhappy people, especially women, who must be allowed to talk as freely as possible when they're in trouble. Moreover, there are characters, too, blurred, so to speak, by sorrow, who all their life long have suffered, have suffered terribly much both of great sorrow and of continued worry about trifles, and who can never be surprised by anything, by any sort of sudden calamity, and who, above all, never even beside the coffin of their dearest, 
can forget the rules of behavior for propitiating people which they have learned by bitter experience. And I don't criticize it. There is neither the vulgarity of egoism nor the insolence of culture in this. There is perhaps more genuine goodness to be found in these simple hearts than in heroines of the loftiest demeanor, but the long habit of humiliation, the instinct of self-preservation, the years of timid anxiety and oppression leave their mark at last. The poor girl who had died by her own hand was not like her mother in this. They were alike in face, however, though the dead girl was decidedly good-looking. The mother was not a very old woman, fifty at the most. She too was fair, but her eyes were sunken, her cheeks were hollow, and she had large yellow, uneven teeth. And indeed everything had a tinge of yellowness. The skin on her hands and face was like parchment. Her dark dress had grown yellow with age and the nail on the forefinger of her right hand had been, I don't know why, carefully and tidily plastered up with yellow wax. Translator's Note This must be an error on Dostoevsky's part. Russian women sometimes plaster with wax the forefinger of the left hand to protect it from being pricked in sewing. The poor woman's story was in parts quite disconnected. I will tell it as I understood it and as I remember it. 5. They had come from Moscow. She had long been a widow, the widow of an unofficial, however. Her husband had been in the government service, but had left them practically nothing except a pension of two hundred rubles. But what are two hundred rubles? Olya grew up, however, and went to the high school. And how well she did! How good she was at her lessons! She won the silver medal when she left. At this point, of course, prolonged weeping. The deceased husband had lost a fortune of nearly four thousand roubles, invested with a merchant here in Petersburg. This merchant had suddenly grown rich again. I had papers. I asked advice. I was told, try, and you will certainly get it. I wrote. The merchant agreed. Go yourself, I was told. Olia and I set off and arrived a month ago. Our means were small. We took this room because it was the smallest of all, and, as we could see ourselves, in a respectable house, and that's what mattered most to us. We were inexperienced women. Everyone takes advantage of us. Well, we paid you for one month. With one thing and another, Petersburg is ruinous. Our merchant gives us a flat refusal. I don't know you or anything about you, and the paper I had was not regular. I knew that. Then I was advised to go to a celebrated lawyer. He was a professor not simply a lawyer but an expert, so he'd be sure to tell me what to do. I took him my last fifteen roubles. The lawyer came out to me, and he did not listen to me for three minutes. I see, says he. I know, says he. If the merchant wants to, says he. He'll pay the money. If he doesn't want to, he won't. And if you take proceedings, you may have to pay yourself, perhaps. You had far better come to terms. He made a joke then, out of the gospel. Make peace, said he, while your enemy is in the way with you, lest you pay to the uttermost farthing. He laughed as he saw me out. My fifteen roubles were wasted. I came back to Olia. We sat facing one another. I began crying. Olia did not cry. She sat there, proud and indignant. She had always been like that with me, all her life, even when she was tiny. She was never one to moan. She was never one to cry but she would sit and look fierce. It used to make me creep to look at her. And wouldn't you believe it? I was afraid of her. I was really quite afraid of her. I've been so for a long time past. I often wanted to grieve, but I did not dare before her. I went to the merchant for the last time. I cried before him freely. He said it was all right and would not even listen. Meanwhile, I must confess that, not having reckoned on being here for so long, we had been for some time without a penny. I began taking our clothes one by one to the pawnbrokers. We have been living on what we have pawned. I stripped myself of everything. She gave me the last of her linen, and I cried bitterly at taking it. She stamped, then she jumped up and ran off to the merchant herself. He was a widower. He talked to her. Come at five o'clock the day after tomorrow, says he. Perhaps I shall have something to say to you. She came home quite gay. He says he may have something to say to me. Well, I was pleased, too, but yet I somehow felt a sort of chill at my heart. Something will come of it, I thought, but I did not dare to question her. Two days later she came back from the merchant's, pale and trembling all over, and threw herself on the bed. 
I saw what it meant and did not dare to question her. And would you believe it, the villain had offered her fifteen roubles. If I find you pure and virtuous, I'll hand you over another forty. He said that to her face. He wasn't ashamed to. At that she flew at him, so she told me. He thrust her out and even locked himself in the next room. And meanwhile, I must confess, to tell the truth, we had nothing to eat. We brought out a jacket lined with hair fur. We sold it. She went to a newspaper and put in an advertisement at once. She offered lessons in all subjects and in arithmetic. If they'll only pay thirty kopecks, she said. And in the end I began to be really alarmed at her. She would sit for hours at the window without saying a word, staring at the roof of the house opposite, and then she would suddenly cry out, If I could only wash or dig! She would say one sentence like that and stamp her foot. And there was no one we knew here, no one we could go to. I wondered what would become of us, and all the while I was afraid to talk to her. One day she fell asleep in the daytime. She waked up, opened her eyes, and looked at me. I was sitting on the box, and I was looking at her, too. She got up, came to me without saying a word, and thrust her arms round me. And we could not help crying, both of us. We sat crying and clinging to each other. It was the first time in her life I had seen her like that. And just as we were sitting like that, your Nastasia came in and said, There's a lady inquiring for you. This was only four days ago. The lady came in. We saw she was very well dressed, though she spoke Russian, it seemed to me, with a German accent. You advertise that you give lessons, she said. We were so delighted then we made her sit down. She laughed in such a friendly way. It's not for me, she said, but my niece has small children, and if it suits you, come to us and we will make arrangements. She gave an address, a flat in Vosnesensky Street. She went away. Dear Olia set off the same day. She flew there. She came back two hours later. She was in hysterics, in convulsions. She told me afterwards, I asked the porter where flat number so-and-so was. The porter looked at her and said, And what do you want to go to that flat for? He said that so strangely that it might have made one suspicious. But she was so self-willed, poor darling, so impatient, she could not bear impertinent questions. Go along then, he said, and he pointed up the stairs to her and went back himself to his little room. And what do you think? She went in, asked for the lady, and on all sides women ran up to her at once, horrid creatures, rouged. They rushed at her, laughing. Please come in, please come in, they cried. They dragged her in. Someone was playing the piano. I tried to get away from them, she said, but they would not let me go. She was frightened. Her legs gave way under her. They simply would not let her go. They talked to her coaxingly. They persuaded her. They uncorked a bottle of porter. They pressed it on her. She jumped up trembling, screamed at the top of her voice, Let me go! Let me go! She rushed to the door. They held the door. She shrieked. Then the one who had been to see us the day before ran up and slapped my Olia twice in the face and pushed her out the door. You don't deserve to be in a respectable house, you skinny slut and another shouted after her on the stairs. You came of yourself to beg of us because you have nothing to eat, but we won't look at such an ugly fright. All that night she lay in a fever and delirious, and in the morning her eyes glittered. She got up and walked about. Justice, she cried. She must be brought to justice. I said nothing, but I thought, if you brought her up, how could we prove it? She walked about with set lips, wringing her hands and tears streaming down her face and her whole face seemed darkened from that time up to the very end. On the third day she seemed better. She was quiet and seemed calmer, and then at four o'clock in the afternoon Mr. Vosilov came to see us, and I must say I can't understand even now how Olia, who was always so mistrustful, was ready to listen to him almost at the first word. What attracted us both more than anything was that he had such a grave, almost stern air. He spoke gently, impressively, and so politely, more than politely, respectfully, even. And yet at the same time he showed no sign of trying to make up to us. It was plain to see he had come with a pure heart. "'I read your advertisement in the paper,' said he. "'You did not word it suitably, madam, and you may damage your prospects by that.' And he began explaining. I must own I did not understand. Something about arithmetic, but I saw that Olia flushed and seemed to brighten up altogether. She listened and talked readily, and to be sure, he must be a clever man. I heard her even thank him. 
He questioned her so minutely about everything, and it seemed that he had lived a long time in Moscow, and it turned out that he knew the headmistress of the high school. "'I will be sure to find you lessons,' said he, "'for I know a great many people here, and I can, in fact, apply to many influential people, so that if you would prefer a permanent situation we might look out for that. "'Meanwhile,' said he, "'forgive me one direct question. Can I be of some use to you at once?' It will be your doing me a favor, not my doing you one, said he. If you will allow me to be of use to you in any way, let it be a loan, said he, and as soon as you have a situation in a very short time, you will be able to repay me. Believe me, on my honor, said he, if ever I were to come to poverty and you had plenty of everything, I would come straight to you for some little help. I would send my wife and daughter. At least, I don't remember all his words, only I was moved to tears, for I saw that Olia's lips were trembling with gratitude, too. If I take it, she answered him, it is because I trust an honorable and humane man, who might have been my father. That was very well said by her, briefly and with dignity. A humane man, said she. He stood up at once. I will get you lessons and a situation without fail. I will set to work this very day for you have quite a satisfactory diploma, too. I forgot to say that he looked through all her school certificates when he first came in. She showed them to him, and he examined her in several subjects. You see, he examined me, Mama, Olia said to me afterwards, and what a clever man he is, she said. It is not often one speaks to such a well-educated, cultured man. And she was quite radiant. The money, sixty roubles, lay on the table. Take it, Mama, said she. When I get a situation, we will pay it back as soon as possible. We will show that we are honest and that we have delicacy. He has seen that already, though. Then she paused. I saw her draw a deep breath. Do you know, Mama? she said to me suddenly. If we had been coarse, we should perhaps have refused to take it through pride. But by taking it now, we only show our delicacy of feeling and that we trust him completely, out of respect for his gray hair, don't we? At first I did not quite understand. But why, Olia, not accept the benevolence of a wealthy and honorable man if he has a good heart, too? She scowled at me. No, Mama, she said, that's not it. I don't want benevolence, but his humanity is precious, and it would have been better really not to have taken the money at all, since he has promised to get me a situation. That's enough, though we are in need. Well, Olia, said I, our need is so great that we could not have refused it. I actually laughed. Well, I was pleased, but an hour later she turned to me. Don't spend that money yet, Mama, she said resolutely. What? said I. I mean it, she said, and she broke off and said no more. She was silent all the evening, only at two o'clock in the night I waked up and heard Olia tossing in her bed. Are you awake, Mama? Yes, I am awake. Do you know he meant to insult me? What nonsense, what nonsense, I said. There is no doubt of it, she said. He is a vile man. Don't dare to spend a farthing of his money. I tried to talk to her. I burst out crying, in bed as I was. She turned away to the wall. Be quiet, she said. Let me go to sleep. In the morning I looked at her. She was not like herself. And you may believe it or not, before God I swear she was not in her right mind then. From the time that she was insulted in that infamous place there was darkness and perplexity in her heart, and in her brain. Looking at her that morning, I had misgivings about her. I was alarmed. I made up my mind I would not say a word to contradict her. He did not even leave his address, Mama, she said. For shame, Olia, I said. You listened to him last night. You praised him and were ready to shed tears of gratitude. That was all I said, but she screamed and stamped. You are a woman of low feelings, she said, brought up in the old slavish ideas. And then, without a word, she snatched up her hat, ran out. I called after her. I wondered what was the matter with her, where she had run. She had run to the address bureau to find out where Versilov lived. I'll take him back the money today and fling it in his face. He meant to insult me, she said. Like Safranov, that's the merchant. But Safranov insulted me like a coarse peasant. But he like a cunning Jesuit. And just then, unhappily, that gentleman knocked at the door. I hear the name of Versilov, he said. I can tell you about him. When she heard Versilov's name, she pounced on him. She was in a perfect frenzy. 
She kept talking away. I gazed at her in amazement. She was always a silent girl and had never talked to anyone like that, and with a perfect stranger, too. Her cheeks were burning, her eyes glittered, and he said at once, "'You are perfectly right, madam. Versilov,' said he, "'is just like the generals here, described in the newspapers. They dress themselves up with all their decorations and go after all the governesses who advertise in the papers. Sometimes they find what they want, or if they don't, they sit and talk a little, make bushels of promises and go away, having got diversion out of it anyway. Olia actually laughed, but so bitterly, and I saw the gentleman take her hand and press it to his heart. I am a man of independent means, madam, said he, and might well make a proposal to a fair maiden, but I'd better, said he, kiss your little hand to begin with. And he was trying to kiss her hand. How she started! But I came to the rescue, and together we turned him out of the room. Then, towards evening, Olia snatched the money from me and ran out. When she came back, she said, I have revenged myself on that dishonorable man, Mama. Oh, Olia, Olia, I said, perhaps we have thrown away our happiness. You have insulted a generous, benevolent man, I cried. I was so vexed with her I could not help it. She shouted at me. I won't have it. I won't have it, she cried. If he were ever so honest, I don't want his charity. I don't want anyone to pity me. I went to bed with no thought of anything. How many times I had looked on that nail in your wall where once there had been a looking glass. It never entered my head. Never. I never thought of it yesterday, and I'd never thought of it before. I had no inkling of it and I did not expect it of Olia at all. I usually sleep heavily and snore. It's the blood going to my head, and sometimes it goes to my heart. I call out in my sleep so that Olia wakes me up at night. What's the matter with you, Mama? She would say. You sleep so heavily there's no waking you. Oh, Olia, I said. I do, I do. That's how I must have slept this night, so that, after waiting a bit, she got up without fear of waking me. The strap, a long one from our trunk, had been lying about all that month where we could see it. Only yesterday morning I had been thinking of tidying it away, and the chair she must have kicked away afterwards, and she had put her petticoat down beside it to prevent its banging on the floor. And it must have been a long time afterwards, a whole hour or more afterwards, that I waked up and called, Olia! Olia! All at once I felt something amiss and called her name, either because I did not hear her breathing in bed or perhaps I made out in the darkness that the bed was empty. Anyway, I got up suddenly and felt with my hand. There was no one in the bed, and the pillow was cold. My heart sank. I stood still as though I were stunned. My mind was a blank. She's gone out, I thought. I took a step, and by the bed I seemed to see her standing in the corner by the door. I stood still and gazed at her without speaking, and through the darkness she seemed to look at me without stirring. But why has she got on a chair, I wondered. Olia? I whispered. I was frightened. Olia, do you hear? But suddenly, as it were, it all dawned upon me. I went forward, held out both arms and put them round her, and she swayed in my arms. I swayed and she swayed with me. I understood and would not understand. I wanted to cry out, but no cry came. Ah! I fell on the floor and shrieked. Vasin, I said, at six o'clock in the morning, if it had not been for your Stabelkov, this might not have happened. Who knows? Most likely it would have happened. One can't draw such a conclusion. Everything was leading up to it, apart from that. It is true that Stabelkov sometimes... He broke off and frowned disagreeably. At seven o'clock he went out again. He still had a great deal to do. I was left at last entirely alone. It was by now daylight. I felt rather giddy. I was haunted by the figure of Versilov. His lady's story had brought him out in quite a different light. To think this over better, I lay down on Vasin's bed just as I was, in my clothes and my boots, just for a minute, with no intention of going to sleep, and suddenly I fell asleep. I don't remember how it happened, indeed. I slept almost four hours. Nobody waked me. End of section one, chapter nine. Part one, chapter ten of 
a raw youth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a raw youth by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnet part one chapter ten i woke about half-past ten and for a long time i could not believe my eyes on the sofa on which i had slept the previous night was sitting my mother and beside her the unhappy mother of the dead girl they were holding each other's hands they were talking in whispers i suppose that they might not wake me and both were crying i got up from the bed and flew straight to kiss my mother she positively beamed all over kissed me and make the sign of the cross over me three times with the right hand before we had time to say a word the door opened and versilov and vassin came in my mother at once got up and led the bereaved woman away vassin gave me his hand why versilov sank into an armchair without saying a word to me mother and he had evidently been here for some time his face looked overcast and careworn what i regret most of all he began saying slowly to vassin evidently in continuation of what they had been discussing outside is that i had no time to set it all right yesterday evening then probably this terrible thing would not have happened and indeed there was time it was hardly eight o'clock as soon as she ran away from us last night i inwardly resolved to follow her and to reassure her but this unforeseen and urgent business though of course i might quite well have put it off till to-day or even for a week this vexatious turn of affairs has hindered and ruined everything that's just how things do happen perhaps you would not have succeeded in reassuring her things had gone too far already apart from you vassin put in no i should have succeeded i certainly should have succeeded and the idea did occur to me to send sophia andreyevna in my place it flashed across my mind but nothing more sophia andreyevna alone would have convinced her and the unhappy girl would have been alive no never again will i meddle in good works and it is the only time in my life i have done it and i imagined that i had kept up with the times and understood the younger generation but we elders grow old almost before we grow ripe and by the way there are a terrible number of modern people who go on considering themselves the younger generation from habit because only yesterday they were such and meantime they don't notice that they are no longer under the ban of the orthodox there has been a misunderstanding and the misunderstanding is quite evident vassin observed reasonably her mother maintains that after the cruel way she was insulted in that infamous house she seemed to lose her reason add to that her circumstances the insult in the first place from the merchant all this might have happened in the past and to my mind is in no way particularly characteristic of the younger generation of to-day it's impatient the present generation and has little understanding of reality and although that's true of all young people in all ages it's particularly so in this tell me what part had mr stebelkoff in the trouble mr stebelkoff i put in suddenly was the cause of it all if it hadn't been for him nothing would have happened he poured oil on the flames versilov listened but he did not glance at me vassin frowned i blame myself for one ridiculous circumstance versilov went on deliberately dwelling on each syllable as before i believe that in my usual stupid way i allowed myself to be lively after a fashion this frivolous little laugh in fact i was not sufficiently abrupt dry and gloomy three characteristics which seemed to be greatly prized by the young generation in fact i gave her grounds for suspecting me of being a gay deceiver quite the opposite i put in abruptly again the mother lays particular stress on your having made the best possible impression through your gravity severity even and sincerity those were her very words the dead girl herself praised you on the same grounds directly after you'd gone 
y yes Versalov mumbled with a cursory glance in my direction at last take this scrap of paper it's essential to the business he held out a tiny sheet to vassin vassin took it and seeing i was looking at him with curiosity gave it to me to read it was a note of two straggling lines scrawled in pencil and perhaps in the dark mother darling forgive me for cutting short my debut into life your olia who is causing you such grief that was only found this morning vassin explained what a strange letter i cried in astonishment why strange asked vassin how can any one use humorous expressions at such a minute vassin looked at me inquiringly and the humour is strange too i went on it's the conventional school jargon that schoolfellows use with one another who could write cut short my debut into life at such a moment in such a letter to her unhappy mother and she seems to have loved her mother too why not write it said vassin still not understanding there's absolutely no humour about it observed versalov at last the expression of course is inappropriate and quite incongruous and may as you say have been picked up from some high school slang or from some journalistic stuff but the dead girl used it in that awful letter quite simply and earnestly that's impossible she had completed her studies and won the silver medal a silver medal has nothing to do with it lots of them complete their studies as brilliantly nowadays the younger generation again said vassin smiling not at all said versalov getting up and taking his hat if the present generation is deficient on the literary side there is no doubt that it possesses other qualifications he added with unusual gravity at the same time many does not mean all you for instance i don't accuse of being badly educated on the literary side and you're a young man too vassin saw nothing wrong in the use of debut either i could not resist saying versalov held out his hand to vassin without speaking the latter took up his cap to go with him calling out to me good-bye for now versalov went out without noticing me i too had no time to lose come what might i had to run and find a lodging now more necessary than ever my mother was not with the landlady she had gone out taking the bereaved woman with her i went out into the street feeling particularly cheerful and confident a new and mighty feeling had sprung up in my soul as luck would have it everything helped to maintain this mood i was exceptionally fortunate and quickly found a lodging in every way suitable of this lodging later but for the moment i will continue with what is more important it was past one when i went back to vassin's to fetch my trunk and again found him at home when he saw me he cried with a sincere and good-humoured air how glad i am you've caught me i was just going out i can tell you a piece of news that i think will interest you particularly i'm sure of that i cried i say you do look cheerful tell me did you know anything about a letter that was preserved by craft and came into versalov's hands yesterday something concerning the lawsuit he has just won in this letter the testator declares intentions contrary to the decision in the law courts yesterday the letter was written long ago i know nothing definite about it in fact but don't you know something to be sure i do the day before yesterday craft took me home with him from those people on purpose to give me the letter and i gave it to versalov yesterday yes that's just what i thought only fancy that's just the business versalov was speaking of just now that prevented him from coming yesterday evening to see that girl it was owing to that letter versalov went straight yesterday evening to prince sokolsky's lawyer handed in the letter and refused to take the fortune he had won by now this refusal has been put into legal form versalov is not making prince sokolsky a present of the money but declares that he acknowledges his claim to it
i was dumbfoundered but ecstatic i had in reality been convinced that Versalop would destroy the letter and what is more though i had told craft that this would be dishonourable and although i had repeated this to myself in the restaurant and had told myself that it was to find a true man not a man like this that i had come yet deeper down that is in my inmost soul i felt that there was nothing to be done but to destroy the letter that is to say i looked upon this as quite a natural thing to do if i blamed Bursla for it afterwards i simply blamed him on purpose to keep up appearances and to maintain my moral superiority but hearing now of Versalov's noble action i was moved to genuine and whole-hearted enthusiasm blaming myself with shame and remorse for my cynicism and indifference to principle and instantly exalting Versalov to heights far above me i almost embraced vassin what a man what a man i exclaimed rapturously who else would have done it i quite agree with you that very many people would not have done it and that it was undoubtedly an extremely disinterested action but finish vassin you have a but yes of course there is a but versalov's action to my mind is a little too hasty and not quite ingenuous said vassin with a smile not ingenuous yes there's too much of the hero on the pedestal about it for in any case he might have done the same thing without injuring himself some part of the inheritance if not half of it might well have remained with him even from the most scrupulous standpoint especially as the letter has no legal significance and he has already won the case the lawyer on the other side shares my opinion i have just been talking to him his conduct would have been no less handsome but simply through a whim due to pride things have turned out differently what's more mr Versalov let himself be carried away by his feelings and acted too precipitately he said himself yesterday that he might have put it off for a whole week do you know vast and i can't help agreeing with you but i like it better so it pleases me more however it's a matter of taste you asked for my opinion or i should have held my tongue even if there is something of the pedestal about it so much the better i said a pedestal may be a pedestal but in itself it's a very precious thing this pedestal is anyway an ideal of a sort and it's by no means an improvement that some modern souls are without it it's better to have it even in a slightly distorted form and i'm sure you think so yourself vassin darling vassin my dear vassin i'm raving but of course you understand me that's what you're for vassin in any case i embrace and kiss you vassin so pleased yes awfully pleased for the man was dead and liveth he was lost and is found vassin i'm a miserable wretch of a boy i'm not as good as you i recognize it just because at some moments i am different deeper and loftier i say this because the day before yesterday i flattered you to your face and i did that because i had been humiliated and crushed i hated you for it for two whole days i swore the same night that i would never come and see you and i came to you yesterday morning simply from spite do you understand from spite i sat here alone criticising your room and you and every one of your books and your landlady i tried to humble you and laugh at you you shouldn't say that yesterday evening when i concluded from some phrase of yours that you did not understand women i felt glad that i was able to detect you in it this morning when i scored off you over the debut i was awfully pleased again and all because i had praised you up so before i should think so indeed vassin cried at last he still went on smiling not in the least surprised at me why that happens with almost every one only no one admits it and one ought not to confess it at all because in any case it passes and leads to nothing is it really the same with every one is every one the same and you say that quite calmly why one can't go on living with such views you think then that to me more dear the lie ennobling than truth dark infamy revealed but that's true you know i cried there's a sacred axiom in those two lines 
i don't know i can't undertake to decide whether those lines are true or not perhaps as always the truth lies in the mean that is that in one case truth is sacred and in another falsehood the only thing i know for certain is that that idea will long remain one of the questions most disputed among men in any case i observe that at the moment you're longing to dance well dance away then exercise is wholesome but i have a mass of work to get through this morning and i've lingered on with you till i'm late i'm going i'm going i'm just off one word only i cried after seizing my trunk my throwing myself on your neck again it's simply because when i came in you told me this news with such genuine pleasure and were so glad i had found you and after the debut incident this morning that real gladness of yours turned my youthful ardent soul to you again well good-bye good-bye i'll do my best not to come in the future and i know that that will please you very much as i see from your eyes and it will be an advantage to both of us chattering like this and almost spluttering in my joyful babble i hauled up my trunk and set off with it to my lodging what delighted me most of all was that Versilov had been so unmistakably angry with me and had been unwilling to speak to me or look at me as soon as i had deposited my trunk i at once flew off to my old prince i must confess that i had rather felt not seeing him those two days besides he would no doubt have heard already about Versilov. two i knew he would be delighted to see me and i protest that i should have gone apart from Versilov altogether what had alarmed me yesterday and that morning was the thought that i might meet katerina nikolaevna but now i was afraid of nothing he embraced me joyfully about Versilov, have you heard i began forthwith on the great news cher enfant my dear boy it's so magnanimous so noble in fact it made an overwhelming impression even on killian this was the clerk downstairs it's injudicious on his part but it's magnificent it's heroic one must cherish the ideal yes one must mustn't one we were always agreed about that my dear boy we always have agreed where have you been i wanted very much to come and see you but i didn't know where to find you for i couldn't go to Versilov's anyway though now after all this you know my boy i believe it's by this he has always conquered the women's hearts by these qualities no doubt of it by the way for fear i forget it i've been saving this up for you a very low fellow a ridiculous fool abusing Versilov to my face yesterday used the expression that he was a petticoat prophet what an expression was it his own expression i have been treasuring it up for you a petticoat prophet may say charmant ha ha but that fits him so well or rather it doesn't foo but it's so apt at least it's not apt at all but never mind never mind don't worry yourself look upon it simply as a bon mot it's a capital bon mot and do you know it has a deep significance there's a perfectly true idea in it that is would you believe it in fact i'll tell you a tiny little secret have you noticed that girl olympiada would you believe it she's got a little heartache for andrei petrovitch in fact it goes so far as cherishing a uh, cherishing what doesn't she deserve i cried with a gesture of contempt mon cher don't shout it's all nonsense it may be you're right from your point of view by the way what was the matter with you last time you were here and katerina nikolaevna arrived you staggered i thought you were going to fall down and was on the point of rushing to support you never mind that now the fact is i was simply confused for a special reason you're blushing now and you must rub it in of course you know that she's on bad terms with Versilov, and then all this so it upset me ek leave that later yes let's leave it i'm delighted to in fact i've been very much to blame in regard to her and i remember i grumbled about her to you forget it my dear she will change her opinion of you too i quite foresee that ah here's prince sergey a handsome young officer walked in i looked at him eagerly i had never seen him before i call him handsome for every one called him so but there was something not altogether attractive in that handsome young face 
i note this as the impression made the first instant my first view of him which remained with me always he was thin and finely built with brown hair a fresh but somewhat sallow skin and an expression of determination there was a rather hard look in his beautiful dark eyes even when he was perfectly calm but his resolute expression repelled one just because one felt that its resoluteness cost him little but i cannot put it into words it is true that his face was able to change suddenly from hardness to a wonderfully friendly gentle and tender expression and what is more with unmistakable frankness it was just that frankness which was attractive i will note another characteristic in spite of its friendliness and frankness his face never looked gay even when he laughed with whole-hearted mirth there was always a feeling that there was no trace in his heart of genuine serene light-hearted gaiety but it is extremely difficult to describe a face like this i am utterly incapable of it in his usual stupid way the old prince hastened to introduce us this is my young friend arkady andreyevitch dolgoruki again andreyevitch the young man turned to me with redoubled courtesy but it was evident that my name was quite unknown to him he's a relation of andrey petrovitch's murmured my vexatious old prince how tiresome these old men sometimes are with their little ways the young man at once realized who i was Ach! i heard of you long ago he said quickly i had the very great pleasure of making the acquaintance of your sister lizaveta makarovna last year at luga she talked to me about you too i was surprised there was a glow of real pleasure in his face excuse me prince i answered drawing back both my hands ah uh, to tell you frankly and i am glad to be speaking in the presence of our dear prince that i was actually desirous of meeting you and quite recently only yesterday desired it with very different motives i tell you this directly although it may surprise you in short i wanted to challenge you for the insult you offered to verslaff a year and a half ago in ems and though perhaps you would not have accepted my challenge as i am only a schoolboy and not of age yet i should have sent you the challenge however you might have taken it or whatever you might have done and i confess i have the same intention still the old prince told me afterwards that i succeeded in pronouncing these words with great dignity there was a look of genuine distress on the young man's face you didn't let me finish he answered earnestly the real cordiality with which i greeted you is due to my present feeling for andrey petrovitch i am sorry i cannot at once tell you all the circumstances but i assure you on my honour that i have long regarded my unfortunate conduct at ems with the greatest regret i resolved on my return to petersburg to make every reparation within my power that is literally to make him an apology in any form he might select the highest and weightiest considerations have caused this change in my views the fact that we were at law with one another would not have affected my determination in the least his action in regard to me yesterday has so to speak moved me to the depths of my soul and even now would you believe it i can't get over it and now i must tell you i have come to the prince to inform him of an astounding circumstance three hours ago that is just at the time when he was drawing up the deed with the lawyer a friend of andrey petrovitch's came to me bringing a challenge from him to a duel a formal challenge for the affair at ems he challenged you i cried and i felt that my eyes glowed and the blood rushed into my face yes challenged me i at once accepted the challenge but resolved before our meeting to send him a letter in which i explained my view of my conduct and my deep regret for it my horrible blunder for it was only a blunder an unlucky fatal blunder i may observe that my position in the regiment forced me to run the risk of this duel and that by sending such a letter before our meeting i have exposed myself to public censure do you understand but in spite of that i made up my mind to send it and i have only not done so because an hour after the challenge i received another letter from him in which he apologizes for having troubled me asks me to forget the challenge and adds that he regrets his momentary outburst of cowardice and egoism his own words 
so that he relieves me from all obligation to send the letter i had not yet dispatched it but i have come to say something about this to the prince and i assure you i have suffered far more from the reproaches of my conscience than any one is this sufficient explanation for you arkady makarovitch for the time at any rate will you do me the honour to believe in my complete sincerity i was completely conquered i found a perfect frankness which was the last thing i had expected indeed i had expected nothing of this kind i muttered something in reply and forthwith held out both hands he shook both of them in his delightedly then he drew the old prince away and talked to him for five minutes in the latter's bedroom if you want to do me particular pleasure he said frankly in a loud voice addressing me as he came out of the prince's room come back straight with me and i will show you the letter i am just sending to andrei petrovitch and with it his letter to me i consented with the utmost readiness my old prince made a great bustle at seeing us off and called me too apart into his room for a minute mon ami how glad i am how glad i am we'll talk of it all later by the way i've two letters here in my portfolio one has to be delivered with a personal explanation and the other must go to the bank and there too and he at once gave me two commissions which he pretended were urgent and required exceptional effort and attention i should have to go deliver them myself give a receipt and so on ah you are cunning i cried as i took the letters i swear all this is nonsense and you've no work for me to do at all you've invented these two jobs on purpose to make me believe that i am of use and not taking money for nothing mon enfant i protest that you are mistaken they are both urgent matters cher enfant he cried suddenly overcome by a rush of emotion my dear young friend he put both hands on my head i bless you and your destiny let us always be as true-hearted as to-day as kind-hearted and good as possible let us love all that is fair and good in all its varied forms well enfin enfin rendons grâce et je te Beni. he could not go on but whimpered over my head i must confess i was almost in tears too anyway i embraced my queer old friend with sincere and delighted feeling we kissed each other warmly three prince sergey as i shall call him that is prince sergey petrovitch sokolsky drove me in a smart victoria to his flat and my first impression was one of surprise at its magnificence not that it was really magnificent but it was a flat such as well-to-do people live in light large lofty rooms i saw two of them and the furniture well padded comfortable abundant and of the best though i've no idea whether it was in the versailles or renaissance style there were rugs carvings and statuettes though everybody said that the sokolskys were beggars and had absolutely nothing i had heard however that prince sergey had cut a dash wherever he could here in moscow in his old regiment and in paris that he was a gambler and that he had debts my coat was crumpled and covered with fluff too because i had slept in it without undressing and this was the fourth day i had worn my shirt my coat was not really shabby but when i went into prince sergey's i recalled verslov's suggestion that i should have a new suit only fancying owing to a case of suicide i slept all night without undressing i observed with a casual air and as he immediately looked attentive i briefly told the story but what interested him most was evidently his letter what seemed strangest to me was that he had not smiled nor betrayed the slightest symptom of amusement when i had told him i meant to challenge him to a duel though i should have been able to prevent his laughing his gravity was strange in a man of his class we sat opposite one another in the middle of the room at his immense writing-table and he handed me for my inspection the fair copy of his letter to Versalov the letter was very much like all that he had just told me at the old prince's it was written with warmth indeed i really did not know at first what to make of his evident frankness and his apparent leaning towards what was good and right but i was already beginning to be conquered by it for after all what reason had i for disbelieving it 
whatever he was like and whatever stories were told of him he yet might have good impulses i looked to it versalov's second note which consisted of seven lines his withdrawal of his challenge though he did it is true speak of his own cowardice and egoism yet on the whole the note was suggestive of a sort of disdain or rather there was apparent in the whole episode a superlative nonchalance i did not however utter this thought aloud what do you think of this withdrawal though i asked you don't suppose he acted from cowardice do you of course not said prince sergey with a smile though a very grave one and in fact he was becoming more and more preoccupied i know quite well how manly he is it's a special point of view his peculiar turn of ideas no doubt i broke in warmly a fellow called vassin says that there's too much of the pedestal about the line he has taken with this letter and his refusing to take the fortune but to my mind things like that aren't done for effect but correspond with something fundamental within i know mr vassin very well observed prince sergey oh yes you must have seen him in luga we suddenly glanced at one another and i remember i flushed a little anyway he changed the subject i had a great longing to talk however the thought of one person i had met the day before tempted me to ask him certain questions but i did not know how to approach the subject and altogether i felt ill at ease i was impressed too by his perfect breeding his courtesy his manner his absence of constraint in fact by the polish which these aristocrats acquire almost from the cradle i saw two glaring mistakes in grammar in his letter and as a rule when i meet such people i am not at all overawed and only become more abrupt which is sometimes perhaps a mistake but on this occasion the thought that i was covered with fluff contributed to my discomfiture so that in fact i floundered a little and dropped into being over familiar i caught prince sergey eyeing me very intently at times tell me prince i blurted out suddenly don't you secretly think it absurd that a youngster like me should think of challenging you especially for an affront to some one else an affront to a father may well be resented no i don't think it's absurd it seems to me that it's dreadfully absurd from one point of view not of course from my own especially as my name is dolgoruki and not versalov and if you're telling me a falsehood or are trying to smooth things over simply from worldly politeness it stands to reason that you are deceiving me in everything else no i don't think it's absurd he repeated with great seriousness how could you help feeling like a son to your father it's true you're young because i don't know i believe that a youth not of age can't fight a duel and a challenge can't be accepted from him by the rules but there is if you like one serious objection to be made if you send a challenge without the knowledge of the offended party on whose behalf you are acting you seem to be guilty of a certain lack of respect to him don't you our conversation was interrupted by a footman who came in to make some announcement prince sergey who seemed to have been expecting him went at once to meet him without finishing what he was saying so the announcement was made in an undertone and i did not hear it excuse me said prince sergey turning to me i'll be back in a moment and he went out i was left alone i walked up and down the room thinking strange to say he attracted me and at the same time repelled me intensely there was something in him for which i could not find a name though it was very repellent if he isn't laughing at me he certainly must be very guileless but if he has been laughing at me then perhaps i should think him cleverer i thought rather oddly i went up to the table and read the letter to versalov once more in my abstraction i didn't notice the time but when i roused myself i found that the prince's minute had lasted at least a quarter of an hour this disturbed me a little i walked up and down once more at last i took my hat and decided i remember to go out to try and find someone to send to prince sergey and when he came to say good-bye to him at once declaring that i had work to do and could stay no longer 
i fancied that that would be the most suitable thing to do for i was rather tormented by the idea that he was treating me very casually in leaving me so long there were two doors in the room both shut and on the same side one at each end of it forgetting which door i had come in by or rather lost in thought i opened one of them and suddenly in a long narrow room i saw sitting on the sofa my sister liza there was no one else in the room and she was certainly waiting for some one but before i had time even to feel surprised i heard the voice of prince sergey speaking loudly to some one and returning to the study i hurriedly closed the door and prince sergey coming in at the other noticed nothing i remember he began to apologize and said something about anna fyodorovna but i was so amazed and confused that i hardly took in what he said and could only mutter that i simply must go home and stubbornly persisting in this i beat a hasty retreat the well-bred prince must have looked with curiosity at my manners he came with me right into the hall still talking and i neither answered nor looked at him Four i turned to the left when i got into the street and walked away at random there was nothing coherent in my mind i walked along slowly and i believe i had walked a good way some five hundred paces when i felt a light tap on my shoulder i turned and saw liza she had overtaken me and tapped me on the shoulder with her umbrella there was a wonderful gaiety and a touch of roguishness in her beaming eyes how glad i am you came this way or i shouldn't have met you to-day she was a little out of breath from walking fast how breathless you are i've been running so as to catch you up liza was it you i saw just now where at the prince's at prince Solkalski's. no it wasn't me you didn't see me i made no answer and we walked on for ten paces liza burst into a fit of laughter it was me of course it was why you saw me yourself you looked into my eyes and i looked into yours so how can you ask whether you saw me what a character and do you know i dreadfully wanted to laugh when you looked at me then you looked so awfully funny she laughed violently i fell to all the anguish in my heart fade away at once but tell me how did you come to be there to see anna fyodorovna what anna fyodorovna madame stole by you when we were staying in luga i used to spend whole days with her she used to receive mother too and used even to come and see us though she visited scarcely any one else there she is a distant relation of andrei petrovitch's and a relation of prince Solkalski's too she's a sort of old aunt of his then she lives at prince Sokolsky's. no he lives with her then whose flat is it it's her flat the whole flat has been hers for the last year prince Sokolsky has only just arrived and is staying with her yes and she's only been in petersburg four days herself i say liza bother her flat and her too no she's splendid well let her be that's her affair we're splendid too see what a day it is see how jolly how pretty you are to-day liza but you're an awful baby though oh katie tell me that girl the one who came yesterday oh the pity of it liza the pity of it ach what a pity what a fate do you know it's a sin for us to be walking here so happily while her soul is hovering somewhere in darkness in some unfathomable darkness after her sin and the wrong done her our katie who was responsible for her suicide oh how terrible it is do you ever think of that outer darkness ach how i fear death and how sinful it is i don't like the dark what a glorious thing the sun is mother says it's a sin to be afraid our katie do you know mother well very little liza very little so far ah what a wonderful person she is and you ought to get to know her she needs understanding yes but you see i didn't know you either but i know you now thoroughly i found you out altogether in one minute though you are afraid of death liza you must be proud bold plucky better than i am ever so much better i like you awfully liza ach liza let death come when it must but meantime let us live let us live oh let us pity that poor girl but let us bless life all the same don't you think so i have an idea liza liza you know of course that verslav has refused to take the fortune you don't know my soul liza you don't know what that man has meant to me not know indeed i know all that you know all about it 
but of course you would you're clever cleverer than bassin mother and you have eyes that are penetrating and humane i mean a point of view that is i'm talking nonsense liza i'm not good for much in lots of ways you want taking in hand that's all take me in hand liza how nice it is to look at you to-day do you know that you are very pretty i have never seen your eyes before i've only seen them for the first time to-day where did you get them to-day liza where have you bought them what price have you paid for them liza i've never had a friend and i've thought the idea of friendship nonsense but it's not nonsense with you shall we be friends you understand what i mean i quite understand and you know we'll simply be friends no conditions no contract yes simply simply with only one condition that if we ever blame one another if we're displeased about anything if we become nasty and horrid even if we forget all this we will never forget this day and this hour let's vow that to ourselves let us vow that we will always remember this day and how we walked arm in arm together and how we laughed and were gay yes shall we yes liza yes i swear but liza i feel as though i'm hearing you talk for the first time liza have you read much he has never asked till now only yesterday for the first time when i said something you deigned to notice me honoured sir mr wiseacre but why didn't you begin to talk to me if i've been such a fool i kept expecting you'd grow wiser i've been watching you from the very first arkady makarovitch and as i watched you i said to myself he'll come to me it's bound to end in his coming and i made up my mind i'd better leave you the honour of taking the first step no i said to myself you can run after me ah you coquette come liza tell me honestly have you been laughing at me for the last month oh you are funny you're awfully funny arkady and do you know what i've been loving you for most all this month is your being so queer but in some ways you're a horrid boy too i say that for fear you should grow conceited and do you know who else has been laughing at you mother's been laughing at you mother and i together oh my we whispered what a queer boy my goodness what a queer boy and you sat all the while imagining that we were trembling before you liza what do you think about versala i think a great deal about him but we won't talk about him just now you know there's no need to talk of him to-day is there quite so yes you're awfully clever liza you are certainly cleverer than i am you wait a bit liza i'll make an end of all this and then i shall have something to tell you what are you frowning at i'm not frowning liza it's nothing you see liza it's best to be open it's a peculiarity of mine that i don't like some tender spots on my soul being touched upon or rather it's shameful to be often displaying certain feelings for the admiration of all isn't it so that i sometimes prefer to frown and hold my tongue you're clever you must understand yes and what's more i'm the same myself i understand you in everything do you know that mother's the same too ah liza oh to live a long while on this earth ah what did you say i said nothing you're looking yes and so are you i look at you and love you i went with her almost all the way home and gave her my address as we parted for the first time in my life i kissed her five and all this would have been very nice but there was one thing that was not nice one painful thought had been throbbing in my mind all night and i could not shake it off this was that when i had met that unhappy girl at the gate i told her i was leaving the house myself leaving home that one left bad people and made a home for oneself and that versloff had a lot of illegitimate children such words from a son about his father must of course have confirmed all her suspicions of verslov's character and of his having insulted her i had blamed stebelkoff but perhaps i had been the chief one to pour oil on the flames that thought was awful it is awful even now but then that morning though i'd begun to be uneasy i told myself it was all nonsense oh things had gone too far already apart from me i repeated from time to time it's nothing it will pass i shall get over it i shall make up for this somehow i've fifty years before me but yet the idea haunted me End of part